I don't know about you, but on Mother's Day, I begin to think of all of the ways in which I brought my mother an awful lot of grief during my growing up. There are certain things that make us blush, certain things that give us a little bit of guilt. Now, I'm not going to be shocked by much. Give a, give a person a little bit of time in ministry and nothing really seems too novel after a while. Um, the human condition is so universal that you begin to realize that people are just people. And they're fallen and they fall. And the best thing that we can do is recognize that and pick each other up much the way that Jesus does for us. But what about those things that make us blush? What about those things that give us guilty feelings? Take, for example, movies. Now, Hollywood has never been really adept at making clean shows, has it? And it seems to be getting worse all the time, or at least I do. <coughs> We've come a long way from 1939 when Red Butler's final comment and Gone with the Wind was the stuff that made people blush and was met with public outrage. So now there's a company called Clean Flix. And all you have to do is send them a movie with any sort of questionable content, be it profanity, be it nudity, be what it may. And they will edit it for you and send it back to you in a way that's edited and cleaned up. Your movie arrives without its problems and emerges a model of propriety that you are able to show either your five-year-old nephew or your 98-year-old grandmother without blushing. Now, some movies have a lot more to edit. Sometimes that means that the plot is even affected. You take out too much and eventually it doesn't even track with the same storyline. There are limits to editing. But now we look to the Revelation lesson for today, and we see the difference between human editing and divine editing. Think, for example, about all the destructive effects of shame. Wouldn't it be wonderful that all those things, all those things that we bury deep within us, all the memories we wish we didn't have, all the things that make us blush, all the shame-triggering events were deleted in such a way that the plot of our life really wasn't change. Oof. God. Deleted. That'd be great. It's not possible this side of the hereafter. But in God's kingdom, we're given a glimpse of where the people of God are presented before God without shame or grief. Fully justified. And so John sees just that. He's given a vision, a heavenly vision, of people with all of their sin and all of their shame deleted in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. Without stain or wrinkle, and quite simply, when I look at that, it's a little too much shock knowing the situation in life I live in now, and then also realizing that heaven is so far beyond anything that I can even ask for a mention. Clean fit flicks would be doing an awful lot of editing on my life. Not because I'm some notorious sinner, because I've caused some form of scandal, but because I, like you, inherited the sin nature of our first parents. And I, on occasion, choose to do the wrong things. It's why you're even to me. I'd love for that part to be edited out. The people in John's vision don't really look quite like anyone we would consider in real life. And John didn't know that either. He asks a nameless elder, who is sort of like his spiritual tour guide, concierge, along a vision of a gigantic multitude of people. And they're standing around the throne of God, in heaven, they're clothed with robes of dazzling light, and they're carrying palm branches, which are symbols of victory. And then the heavenly tour guide says, you know, John, you know who these people are, don't you? 
And he essentially says, um, I haven't got a clue, but you do. John hasn't quite placed himself in the story yet. You see, John has probably been watching movies of real life, and the folks that he knows, you know, the folks like we know, with real flaws in their life, with real problems in life, and then he looks at those in heaven, and it just seems a little surreal. They're too cleaned up. They're too perfected. And by the way, what happened to the shame and what happened to the guilt? You know, the destructive effects of sin and shame, both in John's experience and in ours, and in the lives of others, have a cumulative effect. We get caught up in our problems to the point where we cannot see the forest or the trees at times. Even after experiencing the healing acceptance of God's love in Jesus, for those who belong to him, <coughs> the stars remain. We need to remember that when Jesus arose from the grave, he took the marks of his bodily life with him. He took the nails of our hands, the pierced side, the pierced feet. He didn't come out unscathed. And we, born into eternity, don't come out unscathed either. But then, God does the miracle of perfecting us. Shame is a feeling of profound inadequacy. And unlike guilt, the feeling that where we've done something wrong, shame is often where we fail to measure up to our own standards of ourselves. It's where we have to live into a thousand shoulds and musts. And really, we don't need that. In heaven, there are no shoulds or musts, because we're perfected. Shame is the feeling that somehow we failed at being a person of worth. To see a glimpse into that kind of shame, we need only look at our brothers and sisters who are trafficked in this life. Folks tell us that Grand Island as the highest per capita transactions of human trafficking in Nebraska. Little old Grand Island. These are people with shame, but they didn't do anything wrong. They got brought into something that caused them to feel pain that they shouldn't need to feel themselves. They were used, they were abused, controlled. And these are people of God for whom Christ died. Though for many of us, the burden of shame is a lot less profound than those of trafficked people, traces of shame continue to overshadow our lives, even after we've experienced the healing acceptance of Jesus. The Holy Spirit works to continually heal us and convince us of our healing. But all too often, our scars add up, and they're met with things like hearts and apathy, fatalism. And when there's enough shame, a little bit more and more of them dies. Some people live with their shame to the degree that it almost seems to define who they are. I mean, how many of us know these people who say, I'm not thin enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not smart enough, or sadly, in the church, I'm not holy you know, that's a big barrier between the people outside these walls and the people inside these walls. As we realize here, we're not holy enough, and that's okay. And we always have room for somebody else to experience that same longing for holiness that we are. But this is the good news. The shame and the pain have an end. Because the glimpse that John gets of the huge crowd of white-robed people standing around the throne turns out to be God's answer to the problem of shame. The deepest longings of our hearts, it's a picture of the final answer to the problems that this says. In Revelation 7, we see God's picture, God's duty, God's work, God's transformation. <coughs> These are they who come out of the great ordeal. This elder is wearing a glimpse of something absolutely huge. A ridiculously large number of people. This is not the small little remnant here. 
This is the fullness of the kingdom. And in a life infected with sin and shame, the joy of so many, out of every people, language, tongue, and nation, and all too often we only get a little glimpse of it. So we're talking about God's people throughout all time, in all places and corners of the world. And they're doing the work of ministry in God's presence with their heads held high, with tears wiped away, with all traces of sin and shame gone. And we're in love and peace and fulfillment, what the Hebrew race called Shalom, Abide. That's the core of the gospel. God brings his people through the ordeal in order to meet them with perfection. Death and sin and shame cease. They have an expiration date. And God brings his people through death into life. Real life. Life we have no clue even about at this point. <coughs> when it comes to shame, we will finally be rid of it. And God's people will bask in the presence of all of those things, the, the junk that collects on us through our life, left behind. Now, the true test of any biblical story is can we put ourselves there? You know, that's an exercise for you as you're reading the Bible, and you we often think of this as Bible times or future times. But put yourself into the context of the story and say, can I see myself there? Look closely, because it's our family picture. And we're there. Or will we? Today, the Holy Spirit guides us from the past into the future, giving us a picture of ourselves in flawless perfection. And I feel like we long to be able to look in a mirror and see something like that. That's good news. And when we belong to Jesus, we are not beset by sin and shame. But we've been liberated from that with the eraser of his blood. Joy can come at odd moments, and it always comes as a gift. John sees joy in this moment. Joy can come both amidst the moments where we're on top of the world and the moments where we're in the lowest valley because joy is a gift from God. And this can be our joy. That all the things that you set us now are not things that track with us forever. Something better. No shame, no fear, just love. Just love. All the flaws that have been out. 